social and bodily reality 
contextualization of everything in both structuralist and postmodernist theory has been damned by Marxists and socialist feminists for its utopian disregard for the lived relations of domination that grant the play of arbitrary reading. It is certainly true that postmodernist strategies, like my cyborg myth, subvert myriad organic halls, for example, the poem, the primitive culture, the biological organism. In short, the certainty of what counts as nature, a source of insight and promise of innocence, is undermined, probably fatally. The transcendent authorization of interpretation is lost, and with it the ontology grounding Western epistemology. But the alternative is not cynicism or faithlessness, that is, some version of abstract existence, like the accounts of technological determinism destroying man by the machine or meaningful political action by the text. Whose cyborgs will be is a radical question. The answers are a matter of survival. Both chimpanzees and artifacts of politics, so why shouldn't we? The third distinction is a subset of the second. The boundary between physical and non-physical is very improvised for us. But physics books on the consequences of quantum theory and the indeterminacy principle are a kind of popular scientific equivalent to Harlequin romances as a marker of radical change in American white heterosexuality. They get it wrong, but they are on the right subject. Modern machines are quintessentially microelectronic devices. They are everywhere and they are invisible. Modern machinery is an irreverent upstart to God, mocking the father's ubiquity spirituality. The silicon chip is a surface for writing. It is etched in molecular scales, disturbed only by atomic noise, the ultimate interference for nuclear skulls. Writing, power and technology are old partners in western stories of the origin of civilization, but miniaturization has changed our experience of mechanism. Miniaturization has turned out to be about power. Small is not so much beautiful as preeminently dangerous as in cruise missiles. The TV sets of the 1950s or the news cameras of the 1970s, with the TV wristbands or hand side videos cameras now advertised. Our best machines are made of sunshine. They are all light and clean because they are nothing but signals, electromagnetic waves, a section of a spectrum, and these machines are eminently portable, mobile. A matter of immense human pain in Detroit and Singapore. People are nowhere near so fluid. Cyborgs of ether, quintessence. The ubiquity and invisibility of cyborgs is precisely why these sunshine belt machines are so deadly. They are as hard to see politically as materially. They are about consciousness or its simulation. They are floating signifiers moving in pickup trucks across Europe, blocked more effectively by the witch weavings of the displaced and so unnatural green and women who read the cyborg webs of power so very well by the militant labour of older masculinist politics, whose natural constituency needs defence jobs. Ultimately, the hardest science is about the realm of greatest boundary confusion, the realm of pure number, pure spirit, C3I, cryptography, and the preservation of potent secrets. The new machines are so clean and light, the engineers are sun worshippers mediating a new scientific revolution, associated with the night dream of post-industrial society. Diseases evoked by these clean machines are no more than the minuscule coding changes of an antigen in the immune system, no more than the experience of stress. The nimble fingers of oriental women, the old fascination of little Anglo-Saxon Victorian girls with dolls' houses, women's enforced attention to the small take on quite new dimensions in this new world. 
Thank you. 
itself as far as women can be concerned. Feminist practice is the construction of this form of consciousness, that is, the self-knowledge of self who is not. Perversely, sexual appropriation in this feminism still has the epistemological status of labour, that is to say, the point from which an analysis is able to contribute to changing the world must flow. But sexual objectification, not alienation, is the consequence of the structure of sex slash gender. Realm of knowledge, the result of sexual objectification is illusion and abstraction. However, a woman is not simply alienated from her product, but in a deep sense does not exist as a subject, or even potential subject, since she owes her ex experience as a woman to sexual appropriation. To be constituted by another's desire is not the same thing as to be alienated in the violent separation of the labourer from his product. McKinnon's radical theory of experience is totalizing in the extreme. It does not so much marginalize as obliterate the authority of any other woman's political speech and action. It is a totalization producing what Western patriarchy itself ne never succeeded in doing. Feminists' consciousness of the non-existence of women except as products of men's desire. I think McKinnon correctly argues that no Marxian version of identity can firmly ground women's unity. But in solving the problem of the contradictions of any Western revolutionary subject for feminist purposes, she develops an even more authoritarian doctrine of experience. If my complaint about socialist slash Marxian standpoints is their unintended erasure of polyvocal, unassimilable radical difference made visible in anti-colonial discourse and practice, McKinnon's intentional erasure of all difference through the device of the essential non-existence of women is not reassuring. My taxonomy, which like any other taxonomy, is a reinscription of history. Radical feminism can accommodate all of the activities of women named by socialist feminists as forms of labour, only if the activity can somehow be sexualised. Reproduction had different tones of meanings for the two tendencies, one rooted in labour, one in sex, both calling the consequences of domination and ignorance of social and personal reality false consciousness. Either the difficulties or the contributions in the argument of any one author, neither Marxist nor radical feminist points of view have tended to embrace the status of a partial explanation. Both were regularly constituted as totalities. Western explanation has demanded as such. How else could the Western author incorporate its others? Each tried to annex other forms of domination by expanding its basic categories through analogy, simple listing, or addition. Embarrassed silence about race among white radical and socialist feminists was one major, devastating political consequence. History and polyvocality disappear into political taxonomies that try to establish genealogies. There was no structural room for race or for much else in theory claiming to reveal the construction of the category woman and social group women as a unified or totalizable whole. The structure of my caricature looks like this. Socialist feminism structure of class, wage labour, alienated labour, by analogy reproduction, by extension sex, by addition race, radical feminism, structure of gender, sexual appropriation, objectification, sex, by analogy labour, by extension reproduction, by addition race. In another context, Julia Kristeva claimed women appeared as a historical group after the Second World War, along with groups like youth. Their dates are doubtful, but we are now accustomed to remembering that as objects of knowledge and as historical actors, race did not always exist. Class has a historical genesis, and homosexuals are quite junior. It is no accident that the symbolic system of the family of man, and so the essence of woman, breaks up at the same moment that networks of connection among people on the planet are unprecedentedly multiple, pregnant, and complex. Advanced capitalism is inadequate to convey the structure of the historical moment. In the Western sense, the end of man is at stake. It is no accident that woman disintegrates into women in our time. Perhaps socialist feminists were not substantially guilty of producing a sensualist theory that suppressed women's particularity and contradictory interests. I think we have been, at least through unreflective participation in the logics, languages and practices of white humanism and through searching for a single ground of domination to secure our revolutionary voice. Now we have less
specialization to modular construction, from reproduction to replication, from organic sex role specialization to optimal genetic strategies, from biological determinism to evolutionary inertia constraints, from community ecology to ecosystem chain of being to neo-imperialism, United Nations humanism, from scientific management in home slash factory to global factory, electro and cottage, from family slash market slash factory to women in the integrated circuit, from family wage to to object. 
objects like biotic components, one must not think in terms of essential properties, but in terms of design, boundary constraints, rates of flows, systems logics, costs of lowering constraints. Sexual reproduction is one kind of reproductive strategy among many, with costs and benefits as a function of the system environment. Ideologies of s sexual reproduction can no longer reasonably call on notions of sex and sex role as organic aspects in natural objects like organisms and families. Such reasoning will be unmasked as irrational, and ironically corporate executives reading Playboy and anti-porn radical feminists will make strange bedfellows in jointly unmasking the irrationalism. Likewise for race, ideologies about human diversity have to be formulated in terms of frequencies of parameters, like blood groups or intelligence scores. It is irrational to invoke concepts like primitive and civilized. For liberals and radicals, the search for integrated social systems gives way to a new practice called experimental ethnography, in which an organic object dissipates in attention to the play of writing. At the level of ideology, we see translations of racism and colonialism into languages of development and underdevelopment, rates and constraints of modernization. Any objects or persons can be reasonably thought of in terms of disassembly and reassembly. No natural architectures constrain system design. The financial districts in all the world's cities, as well as the export processing and free trade zones, proclaim this elementary fact of late capitalism. The entire universe of objects that can be known scientifically must be formulated as problems in communications engineering for the managers, or theories of the text for those who would resist. Both are cyborg semiologies. One should expect control strategies to concentrate on boundary conditions and interfaces, on rates of flow across boundaries, and not on the integrity of natural objects. Integrity or sincerity in the Western self gives way to decision procedures and expert systems. For example, control strategies applied to women's capacities to give birth to new human beings will be developed in the languages of population control and maximization of goal achievement for individual decision makers. Control strategies will be formulated in terms of rates, costs of constraints, degrees of freedom. Human beings, like any other component or subsystem, must be localized in a system architecture whose basic modes of operation are probabilistic, statistical. No objects, spaces, or bodies are sacred in themselves. Any component can be interfaced with any other if the proper standard, the proper code, can be constructed for processing signals in a common language. Exchange in this world transcends the universal translation affected by capitalist markets that Marx analyzed so well. The privileged pathology affecting all kinds of components in this universe is stress. Communications break down. The cyborg is not subject to Foucault's biopolitics. The cyborg stimulates po politics, a much more potent field of operations. This kind of analysis of scientific and cultural objects of knowledge, which have appeared historically since the Second World War, prepares us to notice some important inadequacies in feminist analysis proceeded as if the organic, hierarchical dualisms ordering discourse in the West since Aristotle still ruled. They have been cannibalized, or as Zoe Sophia Sophilis might put it, they have been techno-digested. The dichotomies between mind and body, animal and human, organism and machine, public and private, nature and culture, men and women, primitive and civilized, are all in question ideologically. The natural situation of women is their integration, exploitation into a world system of production, reproduction, and communication called the informatics of domination. The home, workplace, market, 
conversations, i.e. as frozen moments of the fluid social interactions constituting them, but they should also be viewed as instruments for enforcing meanings. The boundary is permeable between tool and myth, instrument and concept, historical systems of social relations and historical an anatomies of possible bodies, including objects of knowledge. Indeed, myth and tool mutually constitute each other. Furthermore, communication sciences and modern biologies are constructed by a common move, the translation of the world into a problem of coding, a search for a common language in which all resistance to instrumental control disappears and all heterogeneity can be submitted to disassembling, reassembling, investment and exchange. In communication sciences, the translation of a world into a problem in coding can be illustrated by looking at cybernetic feedback control systems theory design, weapons deployment, or database construction and maintenance. In each case, solution to the key questions rests on a theory of language and control. The key operation is determining the rates, directions, and probabilities of flow of a quantity called information. The world is subdivided by boundaries differentially permeable to information. Information is just that kind of quantifiable element, unit, basis of unity, which allows universal translation, and so unhindered instrumental power called effective communication. The biggest threat to such power is interruption of communication. Any system breakdown is a function of stress. The fundamentals of this technology can be condensed into the metaphor C3I, Command Control Communication Intelligence, the military symbol for its operations theory. In modern biologies, the translation of the world into a problem in coding can be illustrated by molecular genetics, ecology, sociobiological evolutionary theory and immunobiology. The organism has been translated into problems of genetic coding and readout. Biotechnology, a writing technology, informs research broadly. In a sense, organisms have ceased to exist as objects of knowledge, and giving way to biotic components, i.e. special kinds of information processing devices. The analogous moves in ecology could be examined by probing the history and utility of the concept of the ecosystem. Immunobiology and associated medical practices are rich exemplars of the privilege of coding and recognition systems as objects of knowledge, as constructions of bodily reality for us. Biology here is a kind of cryptography. Research is necessarily a kind of intelligence activity. Ironies abound. A stressed system goes awry. Its communication processes break down. It fails to recognize the difference between self and other. Human babies with baboon hearts evoke national ethical perplexity. For animal rights activists, at least as much as for the guardians of human purity. In the US, gay men and intravenous drug users are the privileged victims of an awful immune system disease that marks, inscribes on the body, confusion of boundaries and moral pollution. But these excursions into communication sciences and biology have been at a rarefied level. There is a mundane, largely economic reality to support my claim that these sciences and technologies indicate fundamental transformations in the structure of the world for us. Communications technologies depend on electronics, modern states, multinational corporations, military power, welfare state apparatuses, satellite systems, political processes, fabrication of our imaginations, labor control systems, medical constructions of our bodies, commercial pornography, the international division of labor, and religious evangelism depend intimately upon electronics. Microelectronics is the technical basis of simulacra, that is, of copies without originals. Microelectronics mediates the translations of labor into robotics and word processing, sex into genetic engineering and reproductive technologies, and mind into artificial intelligence and decision procedures. The new biotechnologies concern more than human reproduction. Biology is a powerful engineering science for redesigning materials and processes, has revolutionary implications for industry, perhaps most obvious today in areas of fermentation, agriculture and energy. Communication sciences and biology are constructions of natural technical objects of knowledge in which the difference between machine and organism is thoroughly blurred. Mind, body and tool are on very intimate terms. The multinational material organization of the production and reproduction of daily life and the symbolic organization of the production and reproduction of culture and imagination seem equally, equally implicated. The boundary maintaining images of base and superstructure, public and private, on material and ideal, 
provides fresh sources of power, that we need fresh sources of analysis and political action. Some of the rearrangements of race, sex and class rooted in high-tech facilitated social relations can make socialist 